Hello, Sarah and Mark. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You guys are Sarah Posner and Mark Schmidt. Why don't you introduce yourselves before I tell people what we're going to talk about? Sarah, you want to? Sure. Uh, I'm an investigative journalist and a reporter with Type Investigations, formerly known as the Investigative Fund at the Nation Institute. And I am at work on a book about Donald Trump and the religious right. And your work has appeared almost everywhere. New York Times, Washington Post, The Nation, The New Republic, and on and on. Um, Mark, you are director probably of something at the New America. Of something or other. I I run the political reform program at New America. And I feel like I think I've been on Blogging Heads since 2000 and whenever you started it. Yep. You've you've been with us a while. Periodically, yeah. And you're uh, 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 kind of a Washington insider. You were on uh, Senator Bill Bradley's staff, for example. You've been paying attention I to worked politics. On the, I've been paying attention to politics for a long time. I worked on the Hill, worked at the Foundation, was the editor of the American Prospect magazine for a little while. Um, oh, that's so, right. So, mm-hmm. so, generic, generic Washington dude. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing generic about you, Mark. <laughs> no. Thank you. So you two are eminently qualified to do what I've asked you to do, which is talk me down from the ledge. I'm gravely concerned. Um, When I look at the array of Democratic presidential candidates, I am not filled with confidence that the Democrats are going to take the White House from Donald Trump. I think you two are both a little less concerned than I am. I mean, I feel sure you are because almost everyone is. but. Do you guys look at this field of candidates and say, "Yeah, we're good. Any number of these, uh, any number of these people could could polish him off handily." No, I be, I be, I don't. I think that there is a serious risk of Donald Trump winning re-election, but I don't think that's because of the Democratic field. Okay, so you. Can't- I wouldn't lay it at their feet. I'm I'm not unless looking- you know the Democrats nominate you know Marion Williamson or somebody. Hey. She and I, you know, we're both in that kind of spiritual (laughs) space. I have kind of a soft spot for Marion. But um, the – so, well, let me put it to you this way because this gets to my concern uh, is don't you think it wouldn't be that hard to kind of design like on paper a better candidate than we have? Like just generically describe – like the ideology, the demographics, and so on. That, that's what I don't see, is the, pa- is the candidate who looks like the candidate who, on paper, would be really well-equipped to, to beat Trump. Well, if you were writing that paper, what would it look like? Well, I think the conventional analysis would... Well, first, before I, before I articulate my, my fears any more fully, Mark, do you, do you, 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 your level of optimism is, is what? Well, I mean, I, I think I agree with Sarah. It, we are going to a re-election in what is a strong economy. And that's a, as a basic fact, you can't write off any incumbent president in a situation like that. Um, and, and that's, that's an underlying reality, which I think Trump is, is actually trying his best to scramble. But, uh, that if, if he wins re-election, it will be because of that fact. That people people not paying the level of attention that we are, like which is a reasonable thing to do, have a general sense of like things are okay in this country. We're not at war. Economy seems to be okay. And even you know at this point, even I, I think there's a very delayed reaction to recessions. So I think we should assume that there'll be a generally positive feeling about that. That's going to be a that that's that's the default is that that kind of president gets credited with the economy and gets reelected. Um, that's not, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's the most likely outcome here, but that's your starting point. So you obviously need candidate, a candidate who can draw out in the most effective way, all the reasons that Donald Trump can't be president of the United States. Uh, and, 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 and reassures people that not only can we continue to have 
general prosperity and 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 peace to the extent possible but that we can do we can do much more as a country and we can do much more for people um and i have you know i i don't have a generic um like a candidate who on paper would be good um you know we're 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 sort of pulled between you know a lot of experience on one hand in biden but actually too much experience uh, and too much of a mindset that's 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 rooted in the the 1990s, uh, and on the other hand, people who don't have that much experience who are not really tested at the national level, so you can't really be confident about how that would do. And that has nothing to do with gender or race. It's really, you know, a fresh face is always going to be a gamble. But I'm pretty happy with the possibilities in that in that arrangement, and we can talk more about. It. Some specific, okay. Some so let me articulate candidate. my fears a little more fully. I mean, I think the conventional reckoning is that, uh, you know, one path to Democratic victory would be to win some of the kind of swing voters in the swing state. You know, some of those Midwesterners who could have gone either way reluctantly voted for Trump. They didn't feel that Hillary spoke to their concerns. Maybe they didn't like her either. That's in, there were issues peculiar to Hillary, but. Um, but, you know, somebody who speaks to the, the white working class. So you might, you know, for example, I think a lot of people thought that on paper, a Sherrod Brown was a good candidate. He's got enough of a history of kind of a little bit of an economic nationalist, you know, certainly concerned with like labor issues, worker issues. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, even the fact that he's a white male is considered an asset when you're trying to win over some of these voters. I don't know. But in any event, he didn't enter uh, the race. The next closest thing to him it's, is kind of Joe Biden. But I think uh, Joe Biden, um, the Joe Biden who's a good candidate on paper, on, on paper is a Joe Biden who's 20 years younger or 10 years younger, right. Right. who's mentally more agile. I mean, I worry about Biden having an out-and-out catastrophic senior moment, like saying sure. there are two things we have to remember, and then like <laughs> not, not getting to both of them. But he is already, I thought, in that showdown with Kamala Harris, he showed that he's not as agile as he was four or eight years ago. He was sure. pretty good in sure. debates uh, yeah, earlier yeah. as a vice yeah. presidential candidate. Um, he didn't look very good, and I don't. I and and, and then there are the other. Then there are the things that are emerging via Kamala Harris with him and so on. So I just, among the top force, you've got like, you know, um, you've got Elizabeth Warren. Okay. Kind of older female quasi socialist. Maybe that's not what you'd write down on paper though. If you were after these voters, right? Same with Kamala Harris. She's not exactly what you'd write down on paper. Um, and I could go further in the way I kind of think this is uh, playing out. I personally like Bernie a lot, but I think you can already see that that he's he he, he hasn't sustained really the momentum from the last time around in in a certain right. way. And and he has uh, an age issue, much like Biden's, except that I think he's actually holding up better mentally. I mean, right. I, I think he's right. sharper. Really? I, oh, I do. What do you think? Well, I think he's working. Hard. He's 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 working harder. He's got a solid schedule where Biden doesn't. Yeah. And I don't think Biden has ever really, in his previous campaigns, maybe in 88, I don't, you know, but, but in 2008, he wasn't a high intensity candidate. Um, but Bernie's definitely got the, got, you know, all the energy he ever had. I mean, he, what he doesn't have is in 2016, he was the default left candidate for a party that was eager to go somewhat to the left and, and draw a line under the, particularly the Clinton kind of politics um and he's not that default candidate anymore so i don't you know i think that's his that's his biggest problem as a as a candidate i mean i tend to start off by assuming that sanders and biden will not be the nominee that, and that who the that's biden a, and that, that neither biden nor sanders will be the will nominee be. now that's a big so assumption because so they are still in the first they are still in the first tier in polls and biden is at the top of the polls but we're still in a name recognition period yes. Um, now, yes, so I just, you know, yes, it's definitely name recognition at this point. Biden yeah. was vice president of the United yeah. States for eight years and Sanders was, you know, a contender for the Democratic nomination in 2016. And so a lot of voters are not paying close attention to the field of 20 plus 
yeah, um, yeah. in the meantime. And so, you know, they're both people that they've heard of. Uh, and I think that, well, first of all, I just wanted to address a couple of things that you brought up. I do think Sanders comes across seeming very old, maybe not in the same way that Biden does. Biden came across as old. And I'm, I'm trying not to be ageist here, right? But Biden came across as yeah, old. Please, in I, the, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> in the debate, because I think he just seemed slow on the uptake and a little bewildered. Um, Sanders, I just think he seems a more, little more like a cranky old man. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Which is his appeal, which is part of his appeal. Yeah, I, 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 I think, but I, mean, I, but I think he has a ceiling on that appeal, sure, right? Sure, like, I, yeah, I think yeah. that you know, yeah. he, I think he's won over the people he's going to win over. Like, they're his leftovers from 2016. I don't think he's going to make a lot of forge a lot of new ground uh, with new voter with new voters. No. In part because I think if you're unfamiliar with him and you weren't jazzed up by him in 2016. It's it. He has a he has a pretty tough road to hoe with jazzing up voters who aren't already jazzed up by him. Nope. But I also I wanted to backtrack a little bit with your assumption that what the Democratic nominee needs to do is to appeal to Trump voters. I think that this is going to be a turnout game, not a I'm going to okay. peel away people who voted for Donald Trump in 2016. There was an enthusiasm. Um, I don't know if it was an enthusiasm gap necessarily, but I think that part of the issue that Clinton had in those states that turned the Electoral College for Trump was that they didn't work hard enough in getting out voters in, you know, Detroit or Milwaukee or Philadelphia, right? And so, you know, that could have made the difference. And so it, that's a little bit of an easier job, not that it's easy, but it's easier to convince voters who are like pretty much already in your camp, but maybe a little apathetic than to try to convince voters who kind of like Donald Trump and, you know, to vote for the Democrat instead. And I think that the Republicans are banking on a turnout game, too, just having covered a bunch of different you know, religious right conferences. They're really going to amp up the energy in getting in, in their ground game in 2020. And I think it's because they think that the voters who came out in 2016, you know, that's a level, that's their ceiling. They need to bring out more to win again. And so I think that you have to look at it as a, as a ground game contest more than, um, more than, a, oh, how am I, how am I, you know, a supporter of uh, abortion rights, a supporter of marriage equality, a supporter of even more robust LGBT rights, a supporter of greater government regulation. How are you going to make that case to Democratic voters and then turn around and try to try to convince somebody who voted for Trump in 2016 to vote for you? I just don't think that doesn't that doesn't seem like the best strategy to me. Well, this is what the, the kind of justice Democrats type say when, when, when people say to them, don't you understand you and AOC are tearing the party apart and, and we're going to lose the swing voters. Um, they say, well, you don't understand the swing voters are actually voters who did not show up last time and we want to get them to show up. And, and it's the left that will energize those kinds of voters. That's their line. I'm not so sure. I think there were a fair number of reluctant, uh, Trump voters. Um, I'm, I think I'm related to some, I'm definitely related to some Trump voters. I think, I think at least one of them was a good example of a reluctant Trump voter who, who, who could live with a, a Joe Biden type candidate. But, um, but I don't know, you may be I mean, Mark, how do you come out on this issue of whether, and it's not necessarily dichotomy, like, you know, right. is, is it, is it the swing, the swing voters who, 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 who went for Trump, but are gettable, or is it the, the Democrats who just didn't show up? You know, a little of both could win you the election if you can make well, be- progress on both. But what is your yeah. general view, Mark? Well, before, before Mark jumps in, can I just say one more thing on this? Sure. And that is, I'm not suggesting that they should be trying to, you know, make their most woke case to try to energize these voters. They should be making their most uh equitable economic case to win over these voters. This is not a contest okay. um, about uh, who is the greatest social justice warrior, the most woke or whatever. I really, I do think that the case has to be made on, you know, economic issues, fairness issues about taxes and and corporate, corporate taxes in particular, taxes for the rich, 
all of that. Um, and I think that Elizabeth Warren makes that case really well without sacrificing her positions on more of the social issues. But like, I, I think it's a misnomer to sort of bring AOC into this conversation because she's not running for president and they're not, you know, right. they're not adjusting themselves to her necessarily. I, I, I just think that that's a little bit of a, a red herring. Okay, the but, AOC, but, throwing yeah, the AOC the thing still arises of, of, of uh, you, you know, like, I mean, for example, when most of the candidates on stage say yes, they would, they would not let people continue with their current um, health insurance. Right. And or, or most of the contenders, I, the main contenders, I think, the, the the issue comes up, right? Like, well, wait a second. If we're looking for gettable Trump voters, I'm not sure you want to have to explain to all of them to, that they should trust you and things will be better after you take away their health insurance, right? So, I, I mean, so well, it, it's a consequential question is all I'm saying is which, to what extent you're looking for uh, Democrats who didn't show up last time, and to what extent you're trying to to get the you know proverbial swing voter, right? And and I think I, let's come back to help to health policy in, in a bit. But I think you know kind of the numbers show there's certainly a lot more on the non-voting side, especially if you're if you're looking at what happened between the 08 and 12 elections and. 2016. And in 2016, Donald Trump won 46 percent of the vote. So, you know, it will be very hard for him to win, even even squeaking through the Electoral College with 46 percent of the vote and even harder with 45 percent of the vote. But, you know, and I think there's some of it to be taken away, but there's a lot to be gained. And I think one thing we often forget in American politics is the electorate changes in significant ways. Like, you know, a lot of people who weren't 18 are 18. A lot of people who were, you know, Trump's voters were older. A lot of those people are not going to be voters anymore. So I, there, I, I there are shifts are in that. Thank, are thankfully dead, but I'm glad. I'm glad. You, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kinder about that. <laughs> Some of them might, may just not well, have just an the time to fill out that absentee that, ballot. The, the, the qualifier on that is that the reason there's a correlation um, between age and conservatism isn't just because it it so happens. I mean, that isn't part of it is that people get more conservative as they get old. Well, and to that extent, it doesn't help when the old ones leave the stage. And I'm not saying that's all it is. Yeah, but that isn't all it is. And that's changed somewhat. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I've always been interested in, this is an old, you know, there's an old Kellyanne Conway before she was Kellyanne Conway used to talk, have this whole thing about how, uh, you know, you think women are liberal, but women become conservative as soon as they have, her phrase used to be, I think it was, ma- I think it was marriage, mortgage, moppets, and mutual funds was her phrase. You know that that over time, you know, is, is, that, that people become more concerned about other things that make them more conservative. We haven't generally seen that in women's voting. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing pretty liberal attitudes, pretty pro democratic attitudes running up into people into their forties. You know, the cutoff is somewhere in the in the 40s, depending on, on how polls do those things. I don't think we're really seeing that same, you know, becoming more conservative as one ages. And I think in the Trump era, that that has a very different context than it would have had in, say, the Reagan era. It means something else to, you know, to, to sort of be a, a more liberal voter and then become a Trump voter is a different leap than... Yeah, yeah, and I think, I think if you look at, say, the – I haven't drilled down into the specific demographics of who voted for the Democrats in those flipped Orange County, California seats, for example, right? But there you have seats that were flipped to a Democrat. You could make the argument that Trump has turned people away from the Republican Party, and inst- maybe they haven't become – he hasn't convinced them that Republic, the Republican Party is the conservatism that they want. If indeed they even want to become more conservative, maybe what Trump has done to the Republican Party or more accurately what the Republican Party has let Trump do to it has made voters actually more liberal. Right. I mean, so, you know, I know it's California and the Democrat is going to win all of the electoral votes in California anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wonder if that, that's just a little microcosm of voters, not a microcosm that disproves the idea that voters 
become more conservative as they go, get older or becoming more conservative over time because Trump has scrambled that, as Mark said. Mm-hmm. So let me let me ask you if – well, do you accept the premise that we've already narrowed it down to – I mean, I think the standard reckoning is really um, – for people, right? I mean, Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, because, you know, Buttigieg has done well in fundraising, but he so far seems to have a pretty low ceiling in the, in the polls. And you two seem to think that Bernie and Biden are actually, I think both of you agree that Bernie and Biden are maybe almost out of it themselves, oddly, even though the numbers don't really show it yet. I mean, do you think there are other candidates beyond the ones I've named that we should be taking seriously? Oh, sure. I mean, it's July, Bob. It's July. Okay. You know? I mean, and I think that, and I think that, you know, Buttigieg, Booker, um, probably not Gillibrand, who's just sort of fallen flat in various ways. Um, maybe Klobuchar. I think there are other candidates. Inslee, I think, are candidates who could sort of jump up. And I think some of that depends on, I mean, to say that to say that Sanders and Biden are sort of done is a provocation. That's, you know, it's a it's a, pro, a provocative prediction. I'm comfortable with it. But, you know, the numbers aren't showing that quite yet. But I think if that does happen, you know, you'll probably see somebody else move up for a bit, which is as it should be. I mean, you know, I was thinking back to like at this stage in 2004, you were just beginning to see the rise of Howard Dean you know, in 2003. And then by the time you got into January, all of a sudden, John Kerry, who was totally flat, popped up. And partly that was because there was a huge amount of anxiety about Dean, which seems sort of ridiculous in retrospect. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Very ridiculous. He's a perfectly mainstream guy. Um, But, you know, you could see those dynamics shift pretty dramatically. I mean, people, I mean, there is no reason for people to be paying so much attention to the race or have a position months before mm-hmm. they actually have to vote. Like, like you look at the polls and it's like the right answer to a poll is I'm undecided. <laughs> like you should be undecided um, mm-hmm. until you actually have to decide. So I think there's some, I think there's some room t- for anybody to move. I think it could stabilize into a, a, a Harris Warren race, which I think will be interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but I think that's o- only one of, uh, of several possibilities. Sarah, Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's a billion things that could happen between now and January or February, whenever the Iowa caucuses are. Um, and uh, I just think that predicting now is, you know, kind of pointless. Um, I think that there are some some people in the race who I think obviously are not going to go anywhere, in part because... I just don't see a plausible path for them and their fundraising is just so um, far behind the others that it would be impossible for them to keep up uh, in terms of appearances and ads and all of that. So, I mean, it costs a lot of money to travel around Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I wouldn't count out Biden or Sanders, uh, but at the same time, you know, I I think I think to me Warren looks strong, Harris looks strong, but I could see potentially maybe one of the other candidates popping into the top five that's not Buttigieg. Um, Are there any particulars that you think look? You know, just based on the debates. I mean, I thought that, like, for example, like Hick and Looper and Hick and Looper dropped dropped out, right? I can't no, no, he, didn't, he hasn't dropped right? out yet. Um... He's still Swalwell in, okay. dropped out. Um, no, another, you know, another guy uh, dropped out who, Swalwell like Hickenlooper, I hadn't did. heard of a year Hickenlooper ago. fired his camp, fired all of his staff, which oh, is... Oh, right, but he's still, still in. Right. Um, yeah, I thought that he and Bennett, in both, not to pick on Colorado, I thought they both pr- looked pretty weak and, you know, didn't seem to have any, you know, anything to offer in particular during the debates. I thought that... Inslee, you know, he does have something to offer. His, his position is on, you know, his big issue is climate change. I mean, how can we be sitting here when the temperature outside is, you know, 106, according to my app on my phone? And, you know, not, not think about the guy who's talking about climate change all the time, right? So, like, you don't know what's going to 
take off, what's going to move the voters. So I just think that, you know, there are a few of the people where, you know, obviously Williamson is one of them where you can just pretty much count them out just because they're too far behind at this point, but still, there's still a long way to go for the ones who are still in. One other thing to say about Inslee is he is the governor of, I think, I think Washington's the 13th largest state. You know, governors tend to be good candidates. We've been the Democrat, and that also true for Hickenlooper, although I think he's a less, he's a flatter candidate. But, you know, that's, there's something to be said for that kind of experience. And we don't, there aren't many large state governors, uh, either in the race or, you know, really even in the pool to, to choose from. Yeah, and I, I mean, I trust he's capable of getting a little less monothematic. I, 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 he was yeah. not. I don't. I didn't think he was monothematic yeah. at the debate. He talked about other issues too, but that's his signature issue, and mm-hmm. I don't have an issue with that being his. Yeah, I was actually issue. impressed by how much he didn't seem monothematic. You know, he mm-hmm. wasn't the. This is the answer to everything. I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess one thing that bothers me is even if you move beyond the big four, I still don't see that candidate who um, is, you know, is the candidate on paper and kind of clicks. I mean, Tim Ryan, like literally on paper, if you just write down some things about him, looks okay. I just don't Bob, think Bob, you're just off. doing white guy from Ohio here, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's just... I mean, what's required to really do this is some ability to inspire people, some quick, I mean, right. well, that's what really I'm saying. interesting he lacks, that's traits. What I, that's what I just yeah, said. Yeah. Is like, that's yeah, what yeah. I just said literally on paper, he's okay, and then you hear him talk, and he's not. And but it, why is he okay on numbers. paper? What's See, I think what Mark is saying is he's not even really okay on paper for the 2020 Democratic electorate. I think they're not looking for boring white yeah, guy. Yeah. I mean... How is boring white well, guy going to run against Donald again, Trump? This, I mean, like, this, you're wondering how Kamala Harris is going to run against Donald Trump. I'm wondering how boring white yeah. guy from Ohio runs yeah. against Donald Trump. Um, I'm not saying absolutely. white guy can't run against yeah. Donald Trump, but not boring I, one. I think uh, boring white guy like Tim Ryan, I, I think his bigger problem, I mean, it depends on which model you go with. If you go with the model with, well, we can take for granted pretty good Democratic turnout because everybody really wants to get rid of Trump. The question is the swing voter. Then I think boring white guy is fine. A boring, not, not a white guy who looks like a wimp on stage with Trump, but a boring white guy is fine. Whereas it, whereas if it's about getting, turning out the democratic base, then boring white guy is probably not fine. And I don't really know which model is right. And of course it can be, uh, you know, a, a mixture of the two models, but, um, I just don't, I mean, tell me this. Am I, is this, uh, is this, how do you think that that proverbial swing, swing voter witnessing the Kamala Harris, Joe Biden thing, just, just take, take for one moment, accept the premise that this proverbial swing voter matters. Okay. The gettable Trump voter, working class, white, Rust Belt, whatever. How do you, th- wh- wh- how do you think that alters their perceptions of Biden and or Harris? I, I think it's like, you know, I, I was engaging with this conversation about Biden and Harris on busing, and I remembered like everything I know about busing is from a paper that I wrote sophomore year of high school or junior year of high school, which is the last time I thought about the issue. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, yeah. it's a really arcane conversation. I think it said something important about Biden to to really draw out how much he was really kind of anti integration or anti-deliberate integration, um, at the, as opposed to just, you know, this sort of general position is like, okay, well, busing, that kind of transportation move probably, you know, had some trade-offs that were, that made it not such a great strategy, and then we haven't thought about it in 40 years. Um, but but see, I think a, you're not doing what I ask, which is put yourself in the shoes of the swing voter. You approached it just like a Washington policy guy. You said, let's see, now let's, do I remember the exact specifics of the issue? Well, that's not the way they're looking but, at but it. No, yeah, I mean, it's an arcane thing. It, it, it doesn't have any context. And no, the, the swing voter is isn't actually I, I, watching you know, this debate. I think, I, I think the exchange told us way more about Kamala Harris that would matter to any voter than it told us about Joe Biden. And what, what if Kamala Harris's campaign is smart, you know, this part of her biography, her, you know, triumph over discrimination, her, you know, 
ending up going to law school and becoming attorney general of California and, you know, becoming a United States senator and running for president. This is an inspiring yeah. part of her biography that, you know, should make anyone who's just not a sexist racist feel incredibly yeah. impressed and yeah. awed by her. Um, you know, even if you don't like her the best as any of the presidential candidates, I still think it was, it was a moment where you, it was in your face that, you know, black Americans of her generation experienced a lot of discrimination and still do. <laughs> and, you know, what she had to go through just to go to school. And so I think that it's not, really an occasion necessarily to make voters revisit the arcana of, of the busing mm -hmm. disputes of the 1970s, but to look at Kamala Harris as a, as a person, as an American, as a candidate. And so like if, if a swing voter who's white can't, you know, find some kind of inspiration as an American out of that, they're, they're hopeless for the Democrats. So why bother? Yeah, I think, but I think you're looking at it like a progressive. I think Mark's looking at it like a policy guy. You're looking at it like a progressive. I don't think. No, I'm looking, looking at, at it as somebody who, who wants to hear a life story, right? So, you know, you want to hear, you want to know who is this person? You know, I'm not looking at as, at necessarily as, as somebody who this is not about my politics. It's really more about, I want to hear who these people are. Like, likewise, I wanted to know more about Donald Trump when he was running for president. I wanted to know his life story. It turned out that it was far less appealing. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like from a smart campaigning perspective, you want to tell that story. And she told that story brilliantly during the debate. And, you know, regardless of whether people understand in 2019, what happened with busing in the 1970s, um, you still got the sense of who she was and what her life experience has been and how she has, you know, succeeded uh, in her political and legal and professional life. I completely, and I completely important. agree with that. And I, and I think, you know, any time you have that moment where you're able to say that little girl was me, I mean, that's a huge moment of connection to people. And I think all I was saying, Bob, was I don't think people's views about the policy, about what the substance of that debate, I don't think that, I don't, I don't, I don't think they, that overcomes that impression that people have of Harris. So I think it's not that I'm approaching it as a policy person. I'm just trying to say the policy thing that they were fighting about actually isn't that important to people. That's not going to affect people's views of that. So neither of you imagines that there's a consequential number of people out there going like, um, you're taking to task a white male because he's been alive so long and been a politician that uh, at one point he, 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 he talked to a bunch of constituents who said, I don't like the idea of my kid being bused 10 miles and was responsive to them, right? Because I think, look, the app, I mean, and, and apparently it's a fact that back then in the 70s, uh, the polls I saw like 40% of African Americans yeah. opposed busing, 60% of whites or whatever. But I, I think there are a lot of parents out there who just, they don't know the policy details, but they're just like, wait a second. If you tell me that my kid has to be bused a long way from where they go to high school, I'm assuming there's a lot of parents who are like, um, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, my question is, you don't think that there are these proverbial swing voters going out there going, you know, once and, and remember, one of their grievances is and you can decide whether this makes them racist. But one of their grievances is that the white worker has been neglected, that, uh, you know, affirmative action has worked for African-Americans and so on. But there has been no commensurate policy for them. So I'm not sure they're as ready to get uh, wrapped up in Kamala Harris's story as you would like. But anyway, do you, do you think this, the, the voter I, I'm, I'm worried about is not like consequential or not? If you, if the voter has that level of grievance about school integration and affirmative action, the likelihood that they're a gettable voter for the democratic party in 2020 is minuscule. I think that gettable voters, whether they would 
travel back in time and support busing in the 1970s or not, still would like to think of themselves as supporting the idea that, you know, we should do everything Mm -hmm. possible to, uh, integrate American public schools and so, and, and to carry out the promise of Board B, mm. Brown v. Board of Education. Obviously, there's a lot of, uh, you know, hypocrisy in the sense that like people move to certain whiter school districts because they think the schools are better for their kids and they oppose redrawing the lines and all of that. But setting all of that aside, this is a campaign about whether uh, it, in, in the, in the course of the campaign, this is really a question of how do you feel about the fact that Kamala Harris had the opportunity to go to an integrated school instead of a segregated school? And if you have, if Democrats should only be worrying about voters who are going to say, I feel good about that. If you're going to go after a voter who feels not good about that, Honestly, I'll take any votes I can get. I mean, but you're saying that those aren't gettable anyway. I'm, I'm, they're not going to vote for a black woman. There there are lots of people who wouldn't (laughs) vote for Barack Obama because he's black and he's the only Democrat to win two majorities since 1976. Right, and well, and kind of famously, of course, there are some who voted for uh, Obama apparently and and then voted for Trump. And those are those are the ones you'd like to get back. I mean, I honestly don't think busing. Is a, is, is a big issue, is probably an issue many of these people thought about at all. It's not like a big rural right. Midwest right. Uh, issue. Right. So it's hard for me to figure out. Uh, but, but you're, th- you're thinking about it too narrowly. You're thinking that the Democrats should be going after these we're white working class voters in Ohio yeah. or, yeah. But, you know, they can, the Democrat, Ohio, Ohio is lost to the Democrats. Okay. I mean, it is. You think? It's, it. Sher- Sherrod Brown, of its Sherrod economy, Brown could not win Ohio. Well, I mean, Sherrod Brown might be able to because he's recognizable to them. He's their senator. But, okay, but Biden, I mean, 20 okay, years is, younger, is, couldn't win Ohio? Well, Ohio's not where you start. Well, the point is, Ohio's not where you start. I mean, you could imagine well, also, a landslide. Also, the demographics of Ohio yeah. are, you know, there isn't, Ohio doesn't have a Nashville or an mm. Atlanta, you know, a place where younger Democratic voters are yeah. moving to and living. Oh, okay. people are moving think, away from Ohio. Think it's older. Same, and Think of these same swing voters in Western Pennsylvania, whatever state you think is gettable, but has these kinds of voters, right? Now, why do you go after those voters instead of campaigning in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Philadelphia suburbs? Or, or Sarah, you do because you have an economic message that makes sense. Along right. with some other but you're things, not but you're worry not going to worry about this. You yeah, know, yeah. Whether, uh, you know, this busing yeah. argument, apart from Kamala Harris's, you know, personal biography, you're not going to like get into a whole discussion about busing with them. And you can't worry about whether no. they might be turned off by Kamala Harris's uh, rejoinder to Biden during the debate. Yeah, no, I don't think busing per se is an issue. I was just asking you how you think the optics may have played uh, in that realm, because I, I don't think. We thought a lot about how things played in that realm in general last time around. And I don't think Hillary thought a lot about it. Um, but um, so what what should the message be? I, I mean, what, what do you think is the most winning message? Hillary's message was very much a Trump is scary message. And uh, combined with a, uh, you know, a certain um, appeal to feminism, I would say, a certain celebration of the idea of a woman being president. I mean, she had policy prescriptions. But it always seemed to me that her kind of take home lesson was, isn't this guy scary? And do you think I, I, maybe I'm wrong about that? But in any event, but she was she right. Was right. <laughs> well, of course, she was right, but it didn't work. Well, I think she had to spend a lot of time establishing that point because it wasn't fully like for most people. It's like, oh, Trump's that rich guy who's on The Apprentice. He must know something about something because how do you get rich if you don't know, you know, if you're not good at something? Um, and she had to drive that point across. Four years later, it's a lot clearer why Trump is a problematic president, and and his his approval ratings have been in a in a very very narrow band because a majority have decided that he's a bad guy, um, yeah. and that's that hadn't been established in the same way for Hillary. So the next nominee has less of that work to do. 
um, and can't depend on that as much. And then there were there was a lot about Hillary. There was a lot about the ways in which the Clintons had come to be perceived as a pretty, you know, affluent, been around a long time, part of some kind of system, kind of, you know, Wall Streety or whatever, that was very hard to and overcome. don't discount the conspiracy theories. And the conspiracy theories, theories and, 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 and other stuff. And some of her limitations as a act as a as a politician i mean i think which are will will all be put to the test you know um she obviously you know in some ways she improved a lot she you know she's one of the warmest people in real life and some of that was always hard to fully convey but you know that, that was a particular kind of candidate and and her she didn't have a natural language for talking about her ideas and policies in terms of basic values and how people live their lives and you know, I, I, but this the, the next candidate okay. will be a different so, so, candidate. You know, so Hillary aside, what 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 message do you see winning? And I know it's hard to divorce the message from the candidate. I mean, obviously, Bern, some things sound better coming from Bernie yeah, than yeah, from yeah, others, yeah. and some things, you know, and so on. But so it's well, hard to talk about it in the abstract. But but if, if you can think about it that way, like what themes uh, do you think would be most effective in winning the election? I mean, is it more of an anti-Trump question or a pro-specific policies thing or what? Well, I think that we haven't talked very much about right. Elizabeth Warren today. Right. And, you know, she has a plan for everything, but she also has a very seamless way of um, doing something that Mark was just talking about, uh, Clinton not really having a good facility with, and that is weaving that together both with her life story and with her values, right? So she's very good at, you know, telling the story of, you know, how she, um, you know, her, her growing up and that she wanted to be a teacher and that, you know, her family didn't have a lot of money and, and sort of relating this back to, you know, the economy is working f- only for a very small segment of the population. I mean, I think that this is such, this is a way of being anti-Trump himself, right? And also just having this economic message without even really saying Trump's name, right? The economic message is that, you know, I have a plan so that the economy will work for you and your family and not just for the 1% or the 10% even. And you can talk about that and not you can talk about Trump in that context, but even if you didn't, you know, obviously Trump is very rich and he's also even been profiting from his presidency and his family has too. And so I think just some of these questions of like fundamental fairness in the economy and the way that the Republican Party has basically rigged the system in favor of the rich. Maybe rigging is the wrong word because it's been used by Trump, but it is, you know, this is really what is going on. And this is why people can't get ahead economically. And I think that, you know, of all of the candidates barring Bernie, because I think that he, like I said, I think he has a ceiling because he's a socialist. Warren keeps talking about how she is a capitalist, but she wants more regulation. Now, the, the Republicans have done a good job at making regulation a dirty word and equating it with socialism. But I think she very effectively pushes back on that and portrays regulation as something that's fair and important um, so that everybody has an equal shot. Absolutely. I think it's really imp- I mean, Bob, you referred earlier to Warren as quasi socialist. And that's just like there's not her language is so much about we can make markets work and we can make markets mm-hmm. work for people and we can free markets from the, you know, a particular kind of domination that 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 results in in so much of the gains going to the few. It's a it's a it will be treated as socialism and the dis and a lot about her campaign will depend on people realizing. I mean, I think there are two things that are that 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 her campaign hinges on. One is understanding that distinction between this, you know, language about markets working. It's not really familiar political language in the American discourse, which is more about, you know, okay, we need a few protections from market failure as the sort of moderate liberal position, and you know, markets can do all the work as the as the conservative position, and then you know, Bernie style socialism over here. It's a it's a bit of a new language, but it's it you know it really connects with people's experience 
in the economy to say, oh, yeah. And there's a whole new set. I mean, the, the, the sort of antitrust issues were nowhere on the political agenda in 2016. You know, and I, I, I've been, you know, it's fun because some of my colleagues, former colleagues, friends have been working on those issues. And it's fascinating to see it move forward. It's going to be super important. That You don't think she's been a little, uh, I mean, when she was she the one who listed a bunch of like every tech company for targeting? I mean, do you, do you think she's had a, well, leave aside the yeah. policy questions. Let, let me ask you um, another uh, two questions about her. First, first of all, remind me, was she one of the ones who said, uh, not in so many words, but yes, I will take away your private health insurance. I mean, most of them said that Kamala Harris said it, but walked it back. The question was ambiguous actually, but um uh, Elizabeth Warren is on record as saying people will be um, forced off their private health insurance. Is that right? She raised her hand on that. Yeah. And she's clearly it's I want to I want to say a little more about that. But um, she clearly has deprioritized health reform. And, you know, if you don't make health reform like you, you know, if you don't go a full Inslee on health reform, you're probably not going to do health reform or not do it in the first year or the second year, which actually I think is probably good. Um, I think her instinct is not to make that her signature approach. Her instinct is to make basic repair of, of, of market structures her, her first approach. I will argue, I have a piece coming out in Vox um, in the next day or two. I want to argue that, you know, wh- whatever structure you have, whether it's single pair in which there wouldn't be a place for private insurance, that duplicates the core insurance. Like, you will get your core health insurance through a public program that will be that will be available to everyone, rather than through your employer, uh, if you think of it that way, rather than taking away your private health insurance. And then there's room for private health insurance to provide all kinds of supplementals. 85% of people who are on Medicare are also using private health insurance for, for, for one thing or another. Um, you will... You know that's that's a different language than just saying take away your health insurance. What I'm argue, what I'm going to argue in this piece that's coming out is, you know, health insurance is politically treacherous. Health reform is politically treacherous, no matter what form it takes. Period. You know, the the Clinton. You go back to the '90s. Uh, you know, Harris Wofford wins this special election in Pennsylvania in 1991, and his slogan is, "If people have a right to a lawyer, you should have a right to a doctor." And that gets Democrats into it. They do the Clinton thing. Clinton thing's a complete and utter disaster for all kinds of reasons that I actually remember better than I should. Uh, you know, it, it leads you to 1994 backlash. It's a disaster. 2000, 2000, 2004, Gore and Kerry do the most minimal, minimal, minimal health insurance things, and Bush attacks them as putting government in charge of your health care. It'll lead to rationing. The issue, you know, it's not a backlash, but the issue does nothing for them. Obama, we get it. We get it over the line. But it, the, the backlash was so strong on that one that it led to four separate elections leading up to Trump in which Republicans made gains all on this phony promise of we'll repeal and replace. So health care will kill you if you don't do it right because it's a huge political well, well, problem. Right, but I, I'm not talking about no, the doing of it once you're president. I'm talking about whether during the campaign you want trump to be able to say she or he said they are going to force you to lose your private health insurance and, and instead accept an untested trump's going to say that no matter what just the way george well, w bush no, but did. i mean he can't kill he can't get away he with can a get lie away with that. he oh, can absolutely oh, get really? away with that he will freak and people are anxious health care makes people anxious and he will health care makes people anxious period you know, it's like if you have, if you have, you know, employer cover, if you have employer provided health insurance, when, you know, that yeah. day when the HR person right. has the all staff right. meeting and says, oh, we have some great new changes in our health it plan. Does, it does make people yeah, anxious. You know, you freak out. Wars kill people, yeah. but some wars are worse than others because they kill more people. I mean, you know, it's like. That's uh, not a very Buddhist I think, approach. Not, I, think it's, <laughs> not, I think it's out and out crazy to give him that talking point. And, and and he will have it in debate because they will not be able to rebut it. Whereas if they hadn't said it and he said it in debate, they'd say you're lying. I didn't say that. And I, I think it's I think it's nuts politically. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, let me ask you one more thing about Elizabeth Warren. Um, the uh, do you, you don't think the Native American thing will haunt her in well you know in debate with Trump? I mean I gather 
the situ is the situation that yes, on some form applying for something somewhere, she did check the box and say I'm Native American. So she did, given what we know now about her genetic history, let's say exaggerate to say the least. I, I think that's actually a matter of fact. Am I wrong? About I, I don't that? think it's accurate to say, or I, I don't think we've seen anything that says on a form applying for something. I think that in a directory of law professors, she was listed as that. And she's, she said that she thought it might be helpful if, for people to know that if, you know, if they had a similar background or something like that. So, oh, so it wasn't an applying it's pretty for clear that job. she's never gotten an advantage from it by using that identification, although she has at times used that identification. And it's not always clear wh whether those are like, things she filled out or whether the school listed her that way. Um, Sir, you don't think that'll, you don't think this will haunt her? I mean, I, I mean, in a general, in a general it, election, I mean. Oh, with Trump? Yeah. I actually think that she's so good at rebutting any of his stupidity um, that I just, I, I just don't think that I, I just, I just don't think it will. I mean, I think if it was going to, I thought it was a big mistake for her to do the 23 and me or whatever it was yeah. she did. Um, you know, this was family lore. They believed that, you know, that, you know, and so who, yeah. who cares? It's really more yeah. about, yeah. I mean, like yeah. what, you know, I don't know. Like it just seemed crazy to me that she had done that, had done the test. Um, but I think people, if, if so many things have blown by us at this point in this crazy crazy political environment that we're in that I feel like, you know, yes, Trump might bring it up in a debate or something, but I just don't, I, I, I don't really see him scoring a ton of points on it's it. It's true that it's gotten so much airtime that it's probably people's views are formed on it. I mean, what, what I mean, I, I agree. Let me just say, I agree with Sarah, uh, probably a mistake to take the test. We all have our family lore, whatever. Um, I, my only concern about it is that it kind of muddies the story of her history. And it's important that her his, you know, the fact that she's from Oklahoma, you know, right. the, 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 there's a very, it's, I think people hear Harvard law professor and they assume certain things. And 90% of the time, that's exactly what they should have assumed, you know, came from a pretty privileged background, Ivy, you know, Ivy League BA, Harvard Law School, clerk for these, you know, one of the 10 precise judges that you need to clerk for, and the track goes on. You know, and that track doesn't usually run through Rutgers Law School. You know, and that to me, that's totally fascinating. I don't think that's really mm -hmm. well understood, and I think it will, even just like the possibility that there's some advantage in there that, you know, muddies that story a bit, and that's my biggest well, worry well, about Well, or just it. that aside, does it make it more awkward for her to bring up her story, or does it or if she starts talking about it on a debate stage with Trump, does he say, oh, yeah, that's what you say. You also said you're Native American. I mean, d d does it cost her in that way? I, I mean, again, you're, you're, you're imagining a debate stage with a person who's not trustworthy and and who's, what he says is, is, is going to be unhinged. I mean, you know, he's just going to call her Pocahontas again. That's just what he does. And that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, <laughs> and also, I've seen her many, many, many times mm. talk about her childhood yeah. in Oklahoma. It's a very good story. She does it very well. Mm. And once you've heard it, it disabuses you of the, oh, you know, she must have been raised in Cambridge yeah, yeah. by, you know, by two other Harvard law professors. By the way, I was born in Oklahoma. And I've been going around most of my life saying I think I have some Native American blood because it's actually family lore in my case, although it's, it's actually the it's not so connected to the Oklahoma aspect. But well, I would vote for you, you know, in a minute. <laughs> I would vote for you. I, I, look, I have not ruled myself yeah. out. People ask, would you run if there was yeah. enough of a groundswell yeah, of support? Yeah, yeah. And I, I would run yeah, 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 the, as a Native American. Blogging Heads is going to need to start filing FEC reports. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the debate stage, you have ideas about like which candidates just would do a good job against Trump on a debate stage and which candidates would probably do a bad job, you know, bad job as perceived by voters that matter. Well, you know, watching that debate the, the night that Harris 
uh, confronted Biden on the busing thing, I had a vision of her debating Mike Pence. And I thought, <laughs> that, I, 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 yeah. And but, I, but, I think yeah, she, because, because one common scenario has been a Biden Harris ticket. I'm not sure about the right. Biden part of that anymore, but she right. wind up as a vice presidential team. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that she would, I, I think she would perform well in a debate against Trump. I mean, she just is very confident and forceful and takes no shit. So I think that that, that would be a strong asset yeah. debating him because you have to be quick on your feet, not too willing to take his bait, but willing to stand up to and rebut his lies, basically. And it would, I would imagine it's a hard thing to do, right? Because like normally in a debate, you just think, oh, I have to be really well prepared with all of the facts that I need to know. But I think against him, you also have to be well prepared not to get too flustered, not to get too mad, not to, you know, and I, you, yeah. You also so, have to be prepared. You also have to be prepared for his physical stunts, you know, like right. that point mm-hmm. where he was like standing behind Hillary in a menacing way. Yeah, you I know, mean, I've, there's I've long some bizarre that stuff said, you have to like, do. When he was pacing back behind her, I've long thought that if she had just said, Donald, you have to go to the bathroom or something, <laughs> it would have been devastating. I mean, I, you know, just, but she kind of looked slap him. She should have like, just slapped him. <laughs> so, um, so you, do you have ideas, Mark, about who does great? Or either of you have ideas about which candidates, especially major candidates, you just think wouldn't do well against well, Trump on a debate? Let's, let's, let's consider the possibility that there are no debates. I mean, if you're that there, are, there, there could be no debates. There's no obligation to debate. And if mm-hmm. your campaign is going after, you know, your base and you just want to do rallies and operate that way, you know, there's a lot of logic for Trump not debating. Um, yeah, although that comes at a cost. I think if you're the candidate who refused to debate, I've got to think that carries a cost. Well, you know, there's a low there's a, an event that nobody knows about where where the not Democratic nominee debates a chair or a cardboard cutout or whatever. Um, there's a, there's a, I think there's a strong possibility of no debates. I would also say, I think, I, 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 when I, I saw there was a little clip of Gillibrand, uh, answering a question about white privilege recently, which I, I didn't think she did perfectly, but I thought she did a very good, strong job of expressing, you, you know, there's a confidence about how she expresses herself that I think it, it, it is shared by Gillibrand, Booker, Buttigieg, Harris, and Warren, you know, which is an ability to adapt. Like Sanders has his shtick, you know, he has his one thing. Biden is, I think, a little slow. I think the other ones that I've just named, I think, can completely hold their own in, you know, in a in a face to face with either with Trump or with, you know, a really tough interview, a really tough reporter interviewing them, you know. Isaac Chotner or somebody like that, um, but um, uh, who obviously doesn't do TV, but but somebody who's doing that on, on TV, I think they'd be just fine. Um, they'd be really strong. In fact, stronger probably than Hillary was at that particular aspect of politics. Okay. So I agree. If we could uh, depart from the, the from the from the script, and and I just feel there's no script. This will. <laughs> What, what's that? No it's script. not a script. But it's, it's, uh, what is it? It's an agenda yeah, or something. Yeah. It's a rubric. The, um, you know, this will be posted at the end of a week in which uh, Trump tweeted something that I think uh, created more of a sustained ruckus blowback than any of his tweets. Or maybe it's just been so long that maybe he inured us early to the outlandishness of his tweets that it's actually been a while since one really, um, you know, created a storm. Uh, but this one did, of course, the, uh, the one suggesting that for Congress persons of color uh, go back to where they came from, which in most cases was America, but leaving that aside, um, you all have a sense for, um, I mean, we can, if you want, talk about that somehow in the context of the presidential campaign. It, it almost inherently is. But I guess my question, I'm still waiting very eagerly for the poll. We're taping this on Wednesday. It'll probably air on Friday. I'm waiting for the polls to that, that, will, that haven't shown up yet that will tell us whether this really did Trump some harm. 
I like to think it won't do him some good because everybody who liked it already liked him. But do you have a view uh, about how, if at all, this is going to play out or any observations about it at all? I mean, I think there's a very conventional wisdom at this point, which is correct, which is that, you know, Trump's lowest point was after Char- after his remarks after Charlottesville. These are pretty similar to that. And in their in this degree of their outrageousness and B, Trump's attempt to nationalize the 2018 election in his favor um, by using the issue of immigration was an abject failure. And that's the most likely, you know, you know result of, of this as well. But but it may be that it doesn't have quite the impact. I mean, Charlottesville, a person was killed. Um, you know, there was a very visceral violence. This is about four people who, you know, AOC is pretty well known now. I mean, her name recognition is astonishing. It's It's higher than a number of the presidential candidates, a lot of the presidential candidates at this point. Um, but she's also... You know, she's got some real strengths as well. She's not a, you know, she's, I guess she's a net negative because she's seen as, as liberal, but she's, you know, super articulate and engaged. And I mean, I mean, to me, she's a, to me, it's very hard to see the negatives. Um, but, uh, mo- the others aren't nearly as well known. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it may not have quite the impact of Charlottesville, but I can't imagine it having a positive impact. Sarah, what do you think? I, it, it's not going to have a positive beyond the people who have already right. uh, bowed and scraped to him, uh, including, you know, most of the Republicans in Congress. Um, and, you know, you see uh, all of the excuses that are being made by Kellyanne Conway, by um, you Republican members of Congress, by Fox News, by whatever. Um, you know, you saw Mike Pompeo go on the Christian Broadcasting Network this week, a week when he was hosting a ministerial on religious freedom, the State Department. And he went on the Christian Broadcasting Network to defend Trump's attack on two Muslim congresswomen. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is not causing any of the public Trump defenders to back away. Has he, has anybody come out? You know, so I think after Charlottesville, there was one member of his evangelical advisory board that um, took himself off of it. And I think there were some of these business advisory boards that yeah, disbanded yeah. as a result of his comments on Char- in Charlottesville about Charlottesville. Here, I don't think, have we seen anybody say, okay, this is my last straw with right. Donald Trump? Right. I mean, Justin Amash right. had already right. said right. it, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would hope that it would make people who maybe weren't paying that close attention or had, um, you know, non-committal feelings towards Trump, if there is such a person, uh, to see what he is. But I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's really going to move any needles very much, actually. Yeah, I I fear it may not. I mean, uh, I, I think if the needle moves, it'll move down on its favorability rating, but I, I suspect it won't be a huge thing. I mean, one thing that struck me is just kind of in the how far we have fallen category is that, you know, a lot of attention was rightly paid to the go back where you came from part, but, you know, the and and not so much to the they hate America part. I mean, there was a time like 30 years ago when just saying any elected politician hates America was maybe it was 40 years ago, but it was like, that was considered out of, I mean, when you question the patriotism of some, when you in effect declare them, the oh, enemy, well, that's outlandish, but that's become almost. No, common. I mean, that was what McCarthy did. So, right. But well, right. But, but at the <laughs> but I remember like when uh, rich bond, was he the, uh, the head of the Republican uh, Republican National Committee, Committee like early in when the, he, when he in the said George H. Democrats, w. Bush era. He said something like, Democrats have contempt for the concerns of everyday Americans, which even, isn't even saying you hate America. And I remember David Gergen taking him to task. It was like a new kind of message coming out of someone of that stature in the Republican Party. And and, and I remember David Gergen saying, "You're that's out of line. Well, these days, that's mild compared to several things in that one tweet. And it's just become routine for Republican politicians to point to Democrats and say they hate America. They're basically the enemy. And 
it's just it's just sad. I mean, it's it's not. Well, good. I think it's I think I think it's I think there is a there's a period which I think you've written about a little bit, Bob, of like you know, anti Vietnam War activism had trouble separating opposition to that particular American policy from a sense of opposition to the U.S. military or U.S. interests generally or use of force. And that's like how the McGovern campaign became perceived, right? Um, and it was a problem that, you know, the left has really worked through. And I think, you know, I think Barack Obama's type of patriotism was, a was you know, sort of the end of that line, but it's still kind of a concern. What's so striking about about Trump and this they hate America stuff is he completely equates criticism of a criticism of him with hating America to a degree right. that wasn't you know that, that's different from Nixon or or others. It's all about. I mean, he's the you know I, I think. They attack same out same one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a, I think it's not really an authoritative source, but. Uh, Lara Trump, who's Eric Trump's wife, you some you know how we often talk about like the president is the president of all the people, and she has a quote was like you know because the president is the president of all the people, they need to kind of get behind him and stop criticizing him. Which normally that idea is a constraint on the president, him or herself. The president needs to act in a way that's the president of all the people, and they're just turning that on their head. They're like, I'm the president. You, you, you know, if you don't love me, you don't love America. It's a crazy position, and if, the, you know, I, I just don't, there, there's, you know, there was a lot more to, there was a lot more to hang that hat on in 1972 than there is now, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because that the Vietnam War opposition had a more complex relationship to the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any last uh, words from either of you on this, on the whole presidential race thing? We talked yeah, a lot. Yeah. We did. We talked a lot. Um, so you have, I'm not sure if you've talked me down from the ledge. Uh, you have, you have certainly failed to corroborate my deepest fears and anxieties, I guess. Well, you're going so to be on that ledge. Yeah, I think you're going to be on that ledge for a long time. So get a, ha <laughs> get a hammock or something like that. <laughs> I think it's in my nature to be on the ledge. I think yeah. actually what I should do is, is talk to some Trump supporters about what, how they see these candidates, mm -hmm. who really threatens Trump. I, I mean, uh, actually, a final note is I was curious, like, when Trump was dissing Biden a few weeks ago so relentlessly, I was thinking, you know, people were interpreting that as, oh, Biden's the one he fears. I was thinking, well, surely Trump's smart enough to understand that the more he hates on Biden, the more that helps Biden in the Democratic presidential race, right? To be seen as Trump's big That's enemy. It. So so that must mean Trump thinks he can beat Biden or, or like what? I I mean, just, uh, I, any game, no, any game that hard. involves, you know, the multi levels of Trump's analysis is is just wrong. I think he's sort of that was generous. Familiar, I think he's familiar with Biden. <laughs> He's happy to trash him. He feels like he's got something on Elizabeth Warren because he came up with a nickname. And the rest are, you know, he hasn't really figured him out yet. That's all. So you think the question of the, the crazy or crazy like a fox question about Trump is always accurately answered crazy. Oh, that's yeah, your, yeah. That's, big, yeah, yeah. that's your view. Yeah, that's my that, – that's he, Well, he's so – I mean, he famously can't, you know – digest or have the attention span for any detailed information or numbers or analysis. No, but I mean, he, he acts on impulse. Who, I'm sure he has a sense for who most threatens him as a candidate. And I would just think you, he, he and it's to, just a sense. I don't think it's based on anything, yeah. you know, no, empirical. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying he yeah. would not have to be Einstein to understand that if he faces off against a particular candidate, that actually helps the candidate in the Democratic primaries. He wouldn't have to be Einstein. So I'm asking, could could that be the could could that have been the play with Biden? Like, yeah, I want I want to go. It might have Biden. been the play that week, but then the next week there's another play. I mean, I I, I think he yeah. said that he wants to go against Biden. I think he feels like he's you know. I, I mean, I kind of agree that I think he'd be as strong against Biden as against anybody else. I don't think, I mean, yeah. Biden's only seen as more electable because he's a white man and he's been elected. But um, I don't think there's any real reason to believe that. And, 
you know, he's got a lot of past to dredge up. I, you know, sure, he'd like to run against Biden, but I don't, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Too much. No, he was probably just being reactive. It did come in the wake of Biden, Biden saying unflattering things about yeah, him, yeah. and that's probably a simple explanation. So I concede that you're right about that. I don't concede that you're right that I shouldn't be deeply worried. But thanks for You trying. should be deeply worried. <laughs> you should be deeply worried. Our democracy is in yeah. trouble, okay. but it's not because of the field of democracy. And, and elections are elections are a fucked up way to make decisions. And, you know, they, they have an element of randomness. And, you know, there's nobody's, you know, I can't tell you that he's not going to win again. Of course he might win again. You're not right. you're not ending on a note of reassurance. But Mark. that's what elections are. If, if I did, you shouldn't put me on this uh Esteemed uh, publication is esteemed. Program. I'm going elsewhere for therapy, <laughs> even if I have. <laughs> well, thanks to both of you. Tell yeah. us where we can find your stuff, like where you tweet and stuff. Uh... I tweet at, but not very much lately, just because it's Twitter's making me lose my mind. Uh, at Sarah Posner, and, and I tweet at M Schmidt nine, and I've been pretty. I've been doing a lot uh, on Twitter lately, trying to get my follower count up a little that's, bit. That's S C H M I T T T T T. No D. T T two T's, and, and I tweet at Robert Reiter, W R I G H T E R. And any new works you want to plug? You said you've got a piece coming out. I've got Fox a piece Mark. coming out in a day or two about this politics of health reform that'll probably drive some people crazy. Um, that should be out tomorrow or the next day. I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll be you. I don't think it'll be on our Polyarchy blog, which is our program blog, but on the main box page. Any, any imminent releases, Sarah, or recent releases? No, nope. I have a book coming out next year. So do you have a, do you have a title for it yet? And are you talking about it? You're pretty quiet. We'll talk about it later. What's that? We'll talk about yeah. We'll talk about it later. Soon, soon, soon. Okay, I I provide free advice on titles, so we can. Talk about oh, really? Okay. Yep. It's a service I perform. You've had some excellent. Uh, you have some excellent titles, Bob. Non-zero <laughs> was a good right. title. God, pretty good title. The evolution of the evolution God. of God. Sorry, yeah. even better. God was taken. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, fingers crossed about everything, and we'll see you. I hope not too far from now. So, okay. Okay. Thanks, right. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye.